Well, hello everyone. This is Dr. Charles C. Lucas. And I'm the senior pastor of Promised Land Ministries in beautiful Cumming, Georgia. Welcome to another broadcast of the Promised Land Ministries Network. I am so excited to be with you this morning. Uh, the scripture tells us that this is the day that the Lord has made and I will re be glad and rejoice in it. I'm excited about that. And so, so let's get into the word of God. Let's seek the Lord in prayer and we're going to get into this exciting new series that we started. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God. We praise you. We bless your name, Lord God. We just give you glory, Lord. Father, I just ask you to speak to these, your precious sheep, Lord. I just ask you, I humbly submit myself as a vessel for you to use and teach your people, Lord God, and teach me, Lord God, and, and speak to us what you want to say to us today. Bring light, revelation, and correction, Lord God, and encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay? If you would turn your Bibles to the book of Zechariah, we are going to part two of this great, exciting series. Um, and this series is, how do you get your second breath? Or how do you get your second wind? And, and this series is centered on a, an account of the prophet Zechariah uh, and the angel visiting him a second time. He's talking to uh, about a, another prophet named Zerubbabel. Who had started, he and Zerubbabel actually had started rebuilding the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians. And they had started 10 years ago, but they had run into some opposition. They had run into some, some things that did not, it didn't work out. And so they had built this, built the foundation of the temple, but they were never able to finish it. And so this word is for people who, since this is their year of recovery, and and, and, and this is a word encouraging you to, for people who have tried things in the past uh, and have failed at them, and you know God called you to do them. Maybe it might have been a business. Maybe it might have been having a child. Maybe it might have been joining the military. Maybe it might have been losing the weight. Maybe it might have been going back to school. Maybe it might have been um, getting a promotion, you know, it could have been a bunch of things, but you knew that God told you to do it. Um, he did not. And when you put your whole gusto in it, he didn't tell you to stop. This is the wrong season. You felt it was the right season, but why God that I fail? And then if you are, or have, or, or, and, and then after that, uh, the scripture tells us again, that hope defers makes the heart sick. That means that sometimes you fail because you put your heart in it so much that you don't want to go back and try that again. You don't want to go back and, and restart that church and 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 you had sent out flyers. You said you're gonna you you had been ordained to pass. You had started a church and no one showed up. You know, and now you're questioning who you are. You're in a point of you're questioning your anointing. You're questioning did God really tell me to start that business? Does God really want me to get married? I'm in my thirties or forties. Does God really want me to to um um, start that ministry or was I just, was it me calling myself or was God doing? Because if God does it, that's what I, everybody always says, that he's going to bless it immediately and all this other stuff, right? And so you find yourself in, like Zerubbabel does, in divine frustration. And he just pretty much did what a lot of other people do. He just blew it off and said, okay, well, that's 10 years ago. Um, um, it didn't work out. The foundation was built. I thought and, and God was going to come in and swoop in like he did many times before and redeem us and, and deliver us from our enemies, provide miraculous provision like he did Nehemiah, and it didn't happen. Why is that? Why is that? So that's what we talked about. We're going to go ahead and read Zechariah again. And this and it starts, this starts at, and this is our foundation scripture here, but we're going to land at another place here. And it's Zechariah, and, and we're going to read, I'm going to start at verse 1. I'm going to read probably on down to verse 8 here. Okay, and I'm not going to expound on it because that was part one of the series. Amen. But I'm going to go ahead and read here. And it says this, and the angel talked again and again. If you don't have your Bible, you're wrong. This is Pastor Lucas. So I'm always telling you, don't trust what I say. Don't even trust what I read. You read it yourself. We are raising up Christians who are able to, to be have a personal relationship with God yourself. You don't go through me to get to God. You go through Jesus. I am just part of the fivefold ministry to equip you and how to and how to connect with God and how to grow as a Christian. Amen. So if you need to pause this recording, please, I encourage you to do that and then go and get your Bible. All right. All right. I know. I know. All right. Let's go ahead and read here. Uh, Zechariah chapter four, verse one. And the angel and the angel of the Lord talked with me again. 
this being Zechariah, and walk and wake me as a man that is waking out of his sleep. And he said unto me, what, what, say, what seeth thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick of all gold with a bowl upon the top of it and seven lamps thereof and seven pipes of the seven lamps which are upon um, them, upon top thereof and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side. So I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knoweth thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, with shoutings and cryings, grace, grace unto it. Verse 8, Moreover, the Lord, word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of, Jeru the, of Zerubbabel that have laid the foundation of this house, his hand shall also finish it. Mm. He who began a good work in you will complete it. You started some things, and the same hands that started them will complete them. The same hands that started writing that book will see it published and see it go all over the world. The same hands that, that sacrificed and nurtured that ministry and preached by yourself, and you preached in the and you preached in the streets. You preached and you gave. You did what you were supposed. You forsook your family. You did what you could do. That thing is going to come back because it was God. And he says here, the hands that that have laid the foundation of this house, these hands shall finish it. Then thou shalt know that the Lord of the hosts have sent me. Amen. So the name of this message is going to be part two of the series, How to Get Your Second Breath or Your Second Wind. And it's going to be um, um, learning from your past mistakes. Amen. Learning from your past or learning from the past. Amen. And we're going to go here and we're going to go uh, to Philippians here. And I like this passage. It's in Philippians. If you return there, that will be most gracious. And it's Philippians chapter 3. And again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to keep moving. But I always encourage you to pause, hit the pause button, follow, get your Bible, read along with me. I'll read in the King James Version. You can read another version. But we're going to all get the same location. Get This is serious. When you're serious about, listen to me, when you're serious about recovering your life and you're tired of losing and you know that the word of God has every answer in there to get it. You saw what God has done for Dr. Lucas. I look at all my graduation robes, you know, the, uh, the military uniform um, 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 from being enlisted to, to possibly being an officer from where I was at the age I am now. Harvard Law School someday coming up here. You don't know what I've been through, but you don't know how God has brought me out. So I'm living, I'm telling you stuff that I live. I'm telling you stuff of how to win. I'm telling you stuff that is real in my life. I'm, this is not theory. You're talking to a person, I'm not going to brag, but a person who wins. And I'm showing you how to win in Christ. Amen. So this, this part two is about learning from your past mistakes. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and read here, um, and you need to get your Bible. When I tell you a person who has a history of winning tells you you need to do something, I think you need to do it. And there's no conjunction, no, don't get lazy. Lazy people can't win. Amen? Unless you are cooking, unless you're doing something, and you require your hands, you should have your Bible reading along, and your notepad to get your high, you need your Bible, you need a highlighter, you need a pen, you need a notepad, so you can highlight the scriptures, and then write down where they are, and then go back and study them in your prayer time. If, if you want to know what, what you should be doing in your prayer time, you should be seeking God, going back over your notes, and let that stuff um, etch in your spirit. Because read, listening to this one time is not going to do it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The, the Bible tells us, but it comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Rep repetition is what grows it. Amen? And gets your confidence. Okay, enough of that. Okay, uh, we are in Ephesians chapter 13 here. And I'm going to go ahead and read verse 11. I'm going to keep reading on down here. It says this. And this is Apostle Paul um, um, speaking here. This is one of his last letters before he um, is about to go see, uh, go to Rome. Amen. 
Let's see Nero. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not though that I have apprehended, and he's given his final epitaph here, either by by work that were already perfected. He's saying that I haven't, I'm trying to be perfect in Christ, but of course I have, I have not attained that yet. I'm always trying to be better, but I'm, I'm striving to be. Just because I haven't reached something, just because I haven't succeeded in something, doesn't mean that, that I keep, I quit doing it. Amen. But I follow after that I might apprehend that for which I have also apprehended of Christ. Righteousness, holiness, he's still trying to grow himself as a Christian, even at this later stage. And he knows um, he's in prison. He knows that the devil was coming. He's still pushing towards the high mark here. Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting that thing which is behind me and reaching for the thing which I have before. I press forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. One of the keys to winning is for having a smaller rearview mirror, just like a car, and a big windshield so that you can see. And what that small rearview mirror does, even when you're driving, is you can look back for a little bit, but you can't stare back there and drive forward. It's just to look back, you learn from things. Amen? Apostle Paul is telling us, basically, I've made some mistakes. I'm still growing in Christ. But guess what? I'm looking forward. Because my strength is looking forward. Yes, you have made have you felt like you made had a failure when you tried to have the baby. You tried to go and find a good husband or a good spouse, and you failed at that before. You maybe have had divorces. You might have had bad relationships, and you thought this was God, but it wasn't God. And you were wounded, and you feel confused, and you feel like, Lord, will there be somebody out there for me? You got to bury the past, and you need to go and relate to God as if that didn't happen. Learn from your past, yes, but don't dwell in that. Don't let your mind go back there. Don't let your mind guilt trip you. Some of you have, have made mistakes with your children, and now all of you doing is you're looking in the past, and you've given your life to Christ now, and before you might have been on drugs, before you might have been doing bad things, and you might have been a bad example, and now you've been saved, and the enemy keeps beating you up about your past mistakes. You can't do that in Christ. Or uh, Even the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul says, I can't look back, because if he looks back, it's going to slow him up from apprehending what God has for you. Some of you, God wants you to start being a better parent. God wants you to be a, a better provider. God wants you to be a better spouse. God wants you to build that business. God wants you to start that church over again. God wants you to get back up and preach. But you keep worrying about your mistakes. And you, I'm not I'm not qualified to be a preacher because I made some mistakes. The best preachers I know are people who make mistakes because they are people who are compassionate. They have learned from their mistakes. You've got to forget those things which are behind you now and keep moving forward. I've been looking at this documentary um, um, from Michael Jordan um, called The Last Dance. And I'm a Michael Jordan fan. I went to UNC Chapel Hill. So we're homies, I feel, right? And so so I noticed that he people always show the shots that he won't hit in game winners, but he missed a lot of shots that, that lost games and lost and lost things too. He lost a series. One time somebody um, 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 stole the ball from Michael Jordan and they lost the series and couldn't go to the NBA Finals to get a championship. It cost them a championship. But guess what? Great people do is when they miss their shot, the second that shot doesn't go in, they move on to the next shot. Tiger Woods doesn't sit back there looking at that shot. He might cuss a little bit, but once, once he gets off that tee, he goes to the next hole. He forgets about the last hole. That's what you've got to do. You've got to forget those things which are behind you and press forward. And maybe that thing you believe in God for, and God is telling you to begin again, that you built the foundation of that thing. And the Lord is saying now that not by power, nor by might, but I'm going to come in. God is guaranteed he's going to come in and put his spirit to it now. Now it's time for you to forget those mistakes and don't let the enemy bring those up because those are not mistakes. Those were building blocks. Every time someone made a mistake, that was not a, a point. God allowed those mistakes to humble you, but also to teach you lessons on how to budget your money, who not to trust, who to cut out of your, who cut out. Well, don't go to that bank next time. Go to this bank. 
How many go, oh, Dr. Lucas, I mean, I've been on all these weight loss programs and I haven't, I haven't, I haven't lost any weight. But guess what? You're a weight like, loss expert now because guess what? Out of every failure, there was one little element of success. And now what you need to do, baby, is take those little, those small successes out and take them and use them as a brick and let God build a real house with it. Out of every failure, God allows you to take one relationship, one one trick, one one you know one not that you know one little smart witty idea of how to do things came out of that. You learn you might have failed at the business part, but you learn how to get your LLC. You learn how to get your business license. You learn how to go and pay your taxes. You learn how, where to go. You weren't where not to go. So next time you know, bam, bam, bam. You don't have to waste that much time doing that. So God was actually teaching you. You thought you were you you were you were failing, but God was training you for this season of raining. A lot of times what we consider failure is we have a misconception of like Abraham did. He thought God called him to be a father of nations at 75. He thought by 76, he was going to have five kids. He didn't know it's going to take 25 years because God had to train him first militarily. He had to teach him how to, how to, how to, how to be patient. He had to teach him how to handle his enemies. He had to teach him all these things. He had to build the infrastructure of a nation. He had to, he taught Abraham how to pray. He built his relationship between the two of them. He tested him at Sodom and Gomorrah to see if he had mercy on Lot. Then he comes in now and he says, now you're ready for the physical manifestation of it. And a lot of times God is trying to build the internal you first before you become a CEO and handle a bunch of people. Before you become a pastor, God has been using his 10 years to deal with your bad temper, to deal with your integrity, to deal with your bad relationships so that you don't injure other people. God has anointed you to be a CEO and God allowed you to start the company then to teach you how to manage your money, to get your credit right, to cut off them friends that, that didn't mean any good, to, to get to not to wake up at 10 o'clock, but you've got to wake up at 7.30, 8 o'clock, sometimes at 5, 6 o'clock to start praying. Amen? Those were not failures, they were building blocks. And as I was preparing this message, I got to look over here to my right. But I, I'm going to give you somebody that there's one of my favorite politicians here. Because I want to give you another reason why mistakes and failure and rejection are not the, 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 the worst thing in the world. So why would God tell me to do so? There's this, I, I, and, and as I prayed about this, there are four phases of of success in God in a vision. The first phase is God gives you the vision. God gives you the word of God. You have a prophetic word of God. You prayed about it. You have an idea. You might've went to school and you're so excited um, um, that everything is start. Everything just starts to come together. You got your website, you got your business card. All this stuff just goes bam, 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 bam. So phase one is just easy. You're excited. You're telling everybody you feel like you're going to be a millionaire in one year. The second phase is after that, things get tougher. And guess what? God goes silent. Heaven goes silent. It becomes more of a grind. It becomes colder. It becomes drier. God goes silent. And what do you do with that? And then this phase here is after he goes silent, then all of a sudden you're feeling the, the actual feeling of failure and rejection shows up here. So I'm going to see, I'm going to show you something that you're in right company. There's a man out there called Abraham Lincoln. And this, I'm going to tell you all the failures in his life. First. Let me read them off to you first. Okay. And I'm going to read this article here for you verbatim here. Lincoln didn't quit. Probably the greatest example of persistence is Abraham Lincoln. If you want to learn about somebody who didn't quit, look no further. Born in poverty, Lincoln was faced with defeat throughout his life. Sound familiar? He lost eight elections, twice failed in business, and suffered a nervous breakdown. Hmm? Does that sound familiar? He could quit many times, but he didn't. And because he didn't, he became the greatest president in our history. Look at that. I want to preach right now, but I'm not going to do it. Lincoln was a champion. He never gave up. Here's a stre road stretched to the White House. 18, 
And I want you to read this. I'm going to read it forcefully too. 1816. His family was forced out of their home and he had to work to support them. 1818, his mama died. 1831, he failed in business. 1832, he ran for state legislator and lost. 1832, he lost his job and wanted to go to law school but couldn't get in. Woo! 1833, borrowed some money from a friend and began a business. By the end of the year, he was bankrupt and spent 17 years of his life paying the debt off. 18, Lord, why? You called this man to do this. Why this failure? Why this rejection? I've had a baby. I tried 10 times to have a child. Why, Lord? I'm working hard. I'm living holy. Why can't I, how, why can't I get a husband? And you got some woman over here that's sleeping with anything that moves that's got four, five up. Why, Lord? I kicked that joke out at 11 o'clock and I still can't get somebody. Why, Lord? I'm a holy man to God. Why can't I get a righteous woman? Failing and failing and failing. 1834, ran for a legislator and he won. 1835, he was engaged to be married to sweetheart, but his sweetheart died and his heart was broken. 1836, had a total nervous breakdown and was in bed for six months. 1838, sought to become a speaker of the state legislator and was defeated. 1840, sought to become an, an elector and was defeated. 1843, ran for Congress and lost. 1846, uh, ran again. This time he won and went to Washington and did a great job. 1848, ran for re-election and lost. 1849, saw the job of land officer in his home state and was rejected. 1849, saw the job, I mean, no, no, 1854, ran for, Senate, ran for the United States Senate and lost. 1856, sought to be the vice president nomination I sought the vice president's nomination for his national party's convention and got less than a hundred votes. Woo! Jesus was rejected and despised. A man of no reputation. He was, re he was abandoned. Peter rejected him. He was on that cross naked and afraid. He did time too, just like you did. He was in prison too. They chose Barabbas over him, a man that had healed people, a man that had uh, uh, dried up issues of blood, a man that preached to the woman at the well, a man that fed 5,000 Negroes at one time and turned around and, 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 and fed 7,000. These same people said, give us Barabbas. These same people, yeah, crucify him. I'm about to get excited over here, but I'm going to calm down. 1858, ran for the United States Senate again and lost. 1860, and we know what happened. Elected President of the United States. Don't let your rejection define your value. Don't let what people say about you define your value. Don't let your losses define your value. You need to oh, buckle up and let the Word of God define who you are. You need to uh, hold your chest back and say, I don't know, I don't know what's going on, but I'm still somebody. God has called me for something. I got a prophetic word, and I'm not going to let go of it because what God is trying to do is your calling is so great that He's got to build the infrastructure in you. You're a game changer. I dare not mention Tyler Perry and how many times he failed and failed and failed and failed. You need to go and, and if I can recommend anything, you need to get that TBN interview of Joel Osteen interviewing Tyler Perry and you need to, and it's on YouTube. I, 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 you need to hear that from that young man and how he tried and tried and went into debt trying to get it. And his mama said, baby, you need to go on and get that good paying job at the power company and she saw Tyler Perry's tears and she went back and she saw his heartbreak and she went back and hugged him and said no don't let nobody stop you she didn't know how much it meant to him and so with his last $300 he goes and tries one more play and he looks out and he, he's praying and like, God I don't think nobody gonna show up. People were late. The, the starting time had started, and the play was the, the the theater was empty like usual. And he started praying to God, and saying, "God, I need your help. I need your help, Lord. This ain't gonna work, Lord." He's crying because that's his last chance. And God said, "Shut up. <laughs> look out the window." He said, "Shut up and look out the window." And Tyler Perry begins to cry. He says, "There's people all the way around the building." Don't you give up on God. 
He won't give up on you. If you got a word from God, you need to hold on to that word because a lot of times your heart is God's purifying your heart and you you got good good um heart, but like me a lot of times I I like fight. And God had to give me fight. Because I was bullied growing up younger and I had to learn I would cower down. And so later on like I got in relationships with bullies. God had to teach me to stand up and not stick up for myself because that's demonic, that's selfish, but stick up for God's dream in my life and fight for it. So Lincoln was rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected. So there comes a time that he, and he had to be determined, it built determination in him and the level of determination to get a slave owning nation, the largest slave owning nation in the history of the world to turn their back on slavery and to fight a bloody civil war with 600,000 people dying in one location. The nation being torn and split up. The union at threat. There's fighting while they're shooting in the Hall of Conquerors. One person says, let this be the first act of war. Don C. Calhoun, Calhoun shoots and kills a man in Congress. This man is by himself. His wife is having a mental breakdown. God has to build rejection through it. And, he's, and, he, and out of this time, God is fulfilling the call of God on his life by building something in him, rejection and setback, to build determination in him. To say, don't quit because where you're going, you're going to be facing demonic forces that are not going to quit. I need somebody that's done right, stubborn, that's going to expect failure up front. So he had to make an Abraham Lincoln. He's got to make a person like you because you're custom made for the adversity because you and your mind and your heart is ready for the success. But God is preparing you for the people that are going to go outright come against you because you know what? When you get that money, you know you're going to, he knows you're going to tithe. He knows you're going to build that orphanage. He knows you're going to start adopting people. He knows you're going to do what Tyler Perry and Steve Harvey and Oprah do and give and give. And he can't have that. He don't want these people free. He can't have a bunch of Moseses running around here. So God knows that the enemy is going to be there fighting and your enemy is going to be there. They're waiting on you because they already know you're great. So God is forming your character and getting some tenacity in you. I'm going to preach a series or a sermon called The Power of No. So Lincoln is rejected some 15, 16 times, loses his mama, gets kicked out the house, bankrupts. It took him seven years, 17 years to get out of it, but he's determined. So by the time it comes time and God needs him to free his people and fight a war, it goes on for years that will make any other man throw their hands up. The Confederates said, look, if you sign this peace agreement, we'll stop fighting. And, and all you got to do is give us our slaves back. And Lincoln goes and says, no, not only would I not give them back to you, I'm going to give them the vote too. The man lost his life, got his brains blown out. People were so mad. You know what type of tenacity it takes. You know the pressure of the Oval Office. You know the pressure of that place when you've got different opinions and everybody's looking at you. God is not going to put you in a place of being a CEO or maybe the parent of a single need child without your character being, being developed because you will abandon that child. God is not going to have you with an anointed man of God until he gets that care because there's going to, with anointing comes persecution. So you're thinking, I'm ready for a husband. So why is God building my prayer life? Because you're going to have to pray for him. I'm ready for a wife. Why is God bringing, building my strength? Why is God building my leadership abilities? Why don't he just build my a bank account? Because he, you got to be the leader of your family. You got, he's teaching you now not to be a mama's boy. He's teaching you to be a man of vision and to be able to stand for Christ even when other people don't. That's why you have opposition at your job. And that's why you have opposition in your family because he's, he's building that steel spine in you. Because if you're going to be the husband of a house, he's going to speak. He's not going to speak. He might speak to the wife, but he's going to speak to you with the general orders and the direction that that family needs to go. And there could be rebellion. And you've got to still be able to stick with God and say, no, babe, this is what God said. We're going to have to go here. And let her get mad for a little bit. 
If she loves you, she'll she'll go seek God and God will touch her heart. As long as you do it in love and not be some domineering, so he got to work that out too. Because the difference, that's the difference between a leader and a boss. And if you love your wife, you're not going to want to dominate her. You're going to want her smiling and happy and you're going to want everybody jealous of her. I always say, well, your how your wife should be so pretty and so and so spoiled that a fight break out. They should know. They should know that they got your that's got your last name. And they should know when she walk in the room, oh, that's so and so wife. How can you tell? Oh, look at her. Look at her. That's Abraham wife. How can you tell? Look at her hair. Look at that. Look, look at how she's smiling. She ain't got a wrinkle. That's how it should be, man. There she should be the envy of every other person in that place. I love doing that. I ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> oh, that's Charles Lucas' wife. Yeah, you better be. You 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 better know it. You better know it. That's right. So that's your your wife's your pride and joy, boy. That's your reputation. So if she's smiling, she gonna tell everybody. Well, yeah, you know, I did this. And he took me exactly. She ain't. You ain't got to say that. She talking for you. <laughs> That's right. Think about that. So you go on out there and do is that a dog you want pour or she lavish her with praise, lavish her with work, lavish her with prayer. Build her up, because that's your reputation. You don't want no maid for a while. You can clean your own. Go hire a maid. You need to build her up so when she go out there, everybody know. What's your last name? Someone's Johnson is Allie. Hmm. Huh. <laughs> that's right. So anyway, I, I don't I, what I'm saying is this right here is that your defeat and your failure may not be that. Maybe God is working determination in you. Maybe God is fortifying some things in you. Now, don't say maybe he is. Because if he promised you that business, if he promised you that family, if he promised you that Boaz, if he promised you that, that roof or that Esther, if he promised you that baby, then you're going to get it. But when you look at your failure and God tells you to begin again, you got to understand that you're not by yourself. You're in the company of the, uh, uh, Hannah. You're in the company of Abraham. You're in the company of Abraham Lincoln who have been for me. You're in the company of Jesus Christ who are, have identified with rejection. But with God, you've got to wait and, and let everything play out. So as I end this thing, as I come to my conclusion, I'm going to give you my takeaways. Number one, and this is a homework assignment. I need you to go back and I need you to, 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 to what is that thing I told you guys to do? To go look at. You remember, go back and get the tape. I need you to go look at that. Go look at what I told you to look at. Number two. You need to be at the point that where you understand that when God gave something to you, it was not a lie. You need to get up and try it again and stay busy. Just because that vision died, you keep working on it. You keep breathing. You keep finding ways to improve it. Amen. Number three, you've got to be a person that is that is a professional. you got to be a professional at forgetting your mistakes in your past. The second it happens, you're like, oh, well, that didn't work. Let me go here. Some of you been married more than once. God, ain't, you ain't going to hell for that. Just, oh, well, I, that didn't work out. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going to get my hair done. I'm going to lose this weight. <laughs> and this time, I'm not just going to look at somebody in the flesh this time just because she pretty, you know, or he or he's fine and got a physique or got money. I'm going to look at not just somebody who loves me, but someone who's love with God. And that's what we make mistakes a lot of times. We make, we get somebody that loves us and what will happen is when we want our way, they'll bend rather than satisfy God. You want somebody that's in love with Christ, but not somebody that's spooky. Talk to me now. Next takeaway. Next to it, takeaway is, again, I know I talked about this last um, part one of this series, is I know that you feel weary. I know that you feel um, 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 faint from trying again. 
there's two things I need you to do. I need you to keep rolling this message over and keep rolling this series over to get strength. But then also, I need you to pray and ask God for strength. Did you know that the, the, um, G, the Lord Jesus, while he was in his physical body, body, got strength from angels twice? One time when he came out of, in Matthew chapter 4, after he got tempted by the enemy, the Bible says that angels came to minister to him or to give him strength after that trial, after the fasting, after the trial. And then also in the Garden of Gethsemane, after he was, again, he, he prayed and asked God, God, hey, if there's any way to pass this cup from me, let it go. Then he says, nevertheless, um, I'll go to the cross, not your will, but my will. And he and he ascended to go. He agreed to go to the cross. He ascended to go to the cross. And the Bible says that ministering angels came by to strengthen him. So what am I saying? That you have a right to pray for ministering angels to come and strengthen you, to encourage you, to give you the courage to come up, and then that and and, and to keep you moving forward. And then number five, I want to encourage you with this: is that is that you've got to understand that last time. That you had to do it in your own efforts. That means you had to go gather up everything. You had to go hustle up everything. But I'm reminded of the book Exodus when Moses tried to deliver the people by uh, um, in his own strength by, by killing that man um, and burying his body. He had to wrestle and do that. But when God came, God didn't ask Moses to do his own flesh and strength. All God did was say, use that stick you got in your hand. Maybe God doesn't want you to have, you don't, maybe this time when you try to rebuild what you're going to rebuild, you don't have to come with all that strength and struggle. Maybe God's got a simpler way to do it now. Maybe there's a technology out there. Maybe God's going to send you some help this time. So maybe you're looking at it like, oh my God, I got to start this over again. You don't know what, how much effort it took last time. Maybe it might not take that much effort for you to get pregnant this time. Maybe it might be you look at Mr. Clarence and you guys just fall in love again and have a romantic night. <laughs> You never know. You know, you never know. Maybe it might not be that hard to find a spouse this time. Maybe it might be you doing something and you guys look each other in the eye and you just know it. Because when it's a season of not by power, nor my might, when God's spirit is involved, you cease from the, the, the struggling part of the effort. And God just uses what you have in your hand and he's able to free a nation with it. Amen. All right. Before I close now, we've got to understand that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I know that there is a trend now that just go and, and look at things on the Internet just to get information. And, and what we call in theological terms relativism, which is everybody has their own truth. I don't believe that. I believe that God is God. And, and in order to worship him and to worship him, you've got to do things his way. Amen. Because God, because God is God, God has a way of doing things and he demands us to submit his way of doing things. And his way to make things right with him or to begin a relationship with him is to come through his son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed and gave his life for you or what we call atone for your sins. He was a replacement for that. So you've got to acknowledge that in order to to begin a relationship with him. Amen. And we'll get into that later on as far as an explanation of that in another series. I've got a foundation um, series of what it means to be a Christian. I've taught that and, I, and I'll um, release that later on. I taught it about a year, year and a half ago, and I'll release that series later on. OK, but let's go ahead and pray this if you're ready, because you know that you're ready. You're ready to start your life. Simply, you know that you're ready to start your life over again. You know that you have not been living for God and you have not been living a life that's pleasing to God. And I believe your heart is ready for that. I believe that you're tired of. Of, of trying things in your flesh. And like Zerubbabel, God is telling you to begin again, but this time begin with his spirit. Amen. Amen. So let's begin again. This time we're going to begin with his spirit. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you as a sinner. Forgive me of my sins for I repent. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I surrender to you. Your word says, if I come to you, that you would not turn me away. So Jesus, by faith, I receive you now. And I receive forgiveness of sins. Right now, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that simple, simple prayer, 
I believe that you've been born again because God, again, as I always say, he's not looking at your words. He's looking at your heart. There are some people before they die, they just say, Lord, have mercy on my soul. And they mean it. And God accepts that. He accepts your prayer because your heart is right. I even sense that there's, there's a young man out there now. He's just weeping. He's by his bedroom, hotel bedroom, and, and he's by his bed weeping. And son, let that those, let those tears flow. That's the Lord working on your heart and breaking your heart. And he's cleansing you from what you've done. He's cleansing you from your past. Sit there and just be patient. Don't run out. Just let those tears flow, son. Let them flow. There's nothing wrong with that. Let them flow. Don't be in a hurry to get up. Let them flow. I encourage you, you made this life-changing decision to continue watching my broadcast and let me be your pastor until you can find a local body to, to connect with because I need you to be in a local body so they can shepherd you, they can love you. And not only that, but you have gifts to give. And I don't want to rob you of that just by staying on the internet. I don't want to rob other people of the gifts of your music, of your leadership abilities, of your giving abilities, your ability to serve or to just love or give hugs. So the local body, not you don't just need them, but your local pastor needs you. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and pray for everyone now. And I hope you were encouraged by this message. And I will preach the last installment of our thoughts, the last installment of this series. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you the title of the message. I already know it. I'm excited about it. But but uh, please uh, tune in for that. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We love you. We commit our ways to you, Lord God. You said in all our ways and all gene, you would direct our path. We acknowledge you and you. We surrender to you. Holy Spirit, give us strength to 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 get up and rebuild and to believe again. Lord, I ask you to send prophetic confirmation to these people. Because send them confirmation, uh, whether it be by a friend or by a message, um, that gives them now the go-ahead. And, and Lord, God, I ask you to visit them and give them details on what to do this time. Put people in their lives to help, Lord. Give them some wind underneath their wings, Lord God, and make it easier this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, this is Dr. Lucas saying keep moving.